My name is Laura, and I'm a clergywoman serving a local church in Potomac, Maryland. I've had the privilege of serving seven congregations over the course of my 39 years in ordained ministry. And each week, well, most weeks, I find myself diving deep into the scriptures assigned by the Common Lectionary. It matters not that I have preached most of these passages multiple times. Each sermon is written for the week at hand, and inevitably, there are things left over. Thoughts that I have, ideas that I've gleaned from a variety of voices, usually left on the cutting room floor. And then Matthew joined our staff at Potomac United Methodist Church and challenged me to create a podcast with my leftovers. So here we go. I'm not too old to try a new thing, and I'm hoping that in the few minutes we will share, you might find something loosened in your chest so that hope and grace may fill you to overflowing. That's my simple prayer. Welcome to Leftovers. Here's what I'm thinking about this week. It's the crescendo that's on my mind. You know that moment in a piece of music when your heart gets swept away by the brilliance of the piece and the volume of the performance? It's the denouement, that moment in a piece of literature when all of the threads of the story come together and you have an opportunity to embrace the big picture. The church liturgical year resets every year at this time. Advent is the beginning which makes Thanksgiving the end the crescendo, the denouement. This is the week, my friends, before we return to the beginning of the story, before we take a running start up the hill to Bethlehem. This is the time when we really ought to take a few minutes to articulate what we've figured out this past year, year A by the church calendar. When you name the things for which you are thankful, does Jesus make your top 10 list? Right now, where does God fit into your life design? I can't shake the thought that to be faithful people in the world, we need to have a declarative statement about what we believe, right? Because faith is not one size fits all. Faith is not I'm right and you're wrong. Faith is not a spectator sport. You gotta have some skin in the game. We need to work through our questions, fill in some of the blank spaces. The thing is, to keep showing up on Sunday mornings or not showing up, depending on your reality, to keep the faith flame lit inside our souls, we need to express our reluctance. We need space to weigh our options, to reject that which we cannot believe in favor of those things that ring the bell of truth. Faith is about asking questions, all of your questions. I mean, did God create the heavens and the earth or should we put our trust in the science of evolution? Is it possible to believe in both things at the same time? If God is all that in a bag of chips, why is there so much nonsense happening in the world? How do three college kids visiting Burlington, Vermont for Thanksgiving 20-year-olds who came out of the West Bank of Israel, where they had been friends since birth, had gone to school together since the beginning of their time, who were walking off their full stomachs. How did these three young adults get shot by a man just shy of 50 years old for being Palestinian? I mean, what the crap? Don't you have questions like that? Because I have questions like that. When is Jesus coming back? That's a question. Why is the church such a dysfunctional institution? That's a question. This week on my Facebook feed was a book cover that read, The Church Didn't Hurt You, People Did. One of my former parishioners reposted the title now reading, The Church Hurt You, and I'm Sorry, and Michelle wrote 100%. I mean, that's telling the truth, right? I want to say she didn't write that about me. But the truth is someone else could write that about me. Not every pastor will be your cup of tea and not every congregation will make you feel welcome in their sacred space. Why is that? 
Well, that's a question that has people moving church to church, looking for the mojo that feels right. Why is it so hard for us to get along? Why can't we more easily accept our differences as gift rather than bane? We are all uniquely created, and that's a question. Couldn't we have been designed to agree on more things? To have a default mode that is kind instead of self-serving? Or is that just my bias having spent so many years serving in the church? When I was 12, I had a burning theological question. I might not even remember it, given the way my brain is aging, except that so many faithful adults took umbrage at the query. In my seventh grade year, I attended the Roman Catholic school in my neighborhood. For the first time in my life, I was outside the womb of our community church, and my mind exploded. It took me a full month to recognize that they were saying the Lord's Prayer every morning after we pledged allegiance to the flag. Yes, I knew the Lord's Prayer, but they said it so fast, and they didn't say all of it. They said it so fast like the words were too hot to hold on to for very long, and the Hail Mary don't even get me started on how long it took me to learn that speeding train. Now, I'm not disrespecting the Roman Church. Some of my best friends are Catholics. Isn't that what we say when we're being quasi-disrespectful? Put a little Christian salve on the unpleasantness of our words? Like my Southern mama would have said in telling a story about a horrific thing, and then she would follow it up by saying, bless his heart. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, really. It's just not my cup of tea, the Roman Catholic Church, but then neither is the Greek Orthodox Church that has embraced and brought meaning to my cousin Beth's life. I'm gonna say it again, one size does not fit all. We need the space to ask our questions without judgment so that we can figure out what we believe. It's the crescendo after all. When I was 12, I wanted to know if God is so forgiving, why is there a hell? I mean, that's fair, right? Only Mr. Vermillion, our weekly religion teacher, thought I was being smart, so when he came to teach for the rest of that year, I was sent to the library for study time. No one ever had an answer for me, and trust me when I say I asked everyone I could think to ask. Now I can answer it for myself, and I blame it on free will. If heaven is living in the presence of God, then hell is not. And if hell is not, then you must have the right to choose that. Free will, a great flaw in the grand design, if you ask me. But there you have it. Not everyone chooses God, even though God chooses everyone. I mean, that's an example of what I believe. It's what I believe, but you can think I'm pretty far off the mark. The amazing thing about being a pastor is that I get to live my faith out loud every day. In some places, it's expected of me. It caused me deep concern for years because I can name 10 reasons on any given day why God might have been better off choosing a different person until I discovered that God chooses everyone. It never was just me. It never was about just me. It was an open invitation to ask my questions and figure out what I believe. It was an expectation that if I believed it, I might want to say something about it. And if I spoke about my faith often enough, I might believe all the more. A young pastor once told an experienced preacher who was doubting, preach like you believe, and then you will believe enough to preach. I find truth in that old story. This past Sunday in worship, we read the Apostles' Creed as well as the Nicene Creed, both examples of believers working out their affirmations. The groups who did that writing were all men, all Orthodox or Catholic, all Middle Eastern, and they have been resonating in the life of corporate worship since the end of the second century. Still, it feels to me like we might have a better chance of living faithful lives if we take the time to state our truths. So here's where I am. I believe that Jesus was the child of God. I believe that Jesus was God incarnate on earth. 
I believe that Jesus came to fulfill the prophecies given with loving care to the Hebrew people whose relationship with God goes back to the very beginning of time. I believe this scripture is the inspired word of God that is too often used to banish and bash. It's not meant to be taken literally, I don't believe. Just ask anyone with short hair wearing mixed fabric fibers. I believe that the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside our beings in the part of us we call the soul at our invitation, not like an alien life form. I believe she is breath, hope, resilience. I believe she is strength and nourishment. I believe she is. I believe that the church is at its best when we refrain from judgment, acknowledge our sin personally and congregationally, individually and corporately. I believe we are responsible for one another, whether we like it or not. I believe we should sing more, laugh more, love more, dance more, shout hallelujah more. But that's just me. Today is the crescendo, my friends. So what do you say you believe? Let the grace of God wrap you in arms that feel like they will never let you go. Be blessed to be a blessing. And I'll meet you right back here next week.